not a whole lot of insect problems compared to what other people are facing. But since the Ag Commissioner's here today, we're all going to have to stand around till noon time <laughs> to get your hour. And uh, so you might want to come into the shade at that point or dip in the canal, whichever. Uh, I've got some handouts here for those who are interested. It's just a review of, of uh, Liga's assessment. First one here. Liga's, uh, I need a couple of notes here. Liga's assessment that you've seen over the years with the uh, retained square. So it's just a review for, uh, for your view. Um, I just want to cover briefly sort of the insect situation, which has already been covered to a large extent because uh, there isn't a whole lot out there right now. I personally think the, um, even though we had a later planting than usual, you know, we had a very, very tight, concentrated planting. It wasn't spread over a number of uh, weeks or months. It was really in a four week period, so to speak. Good conditions following that, vigorous crop came up. So when we have a, a planting like that, it means cotton fields are gonna be nearly the same age at the same stages. So less of a problem with a younger field next to an older field, and those kinds of issues with bugs moving back and forth. The lag of situations everybody's recognized has been, has been low for the most part. Our rainfall patterns this year did not attribute, uh, was not conducive to lag of buildup. We didn't have any rain until spring. So anything where our usual buildup occurs on the wild rangeland, those guys had to leave uh, prior to the rains coming. So they were already forced down, whether they survived or not, no reproduction occurred uh, up in that area, uh, which means if we're gonna have a lagus problem in a cotton field, it's gonna come from within spitting distance of that cotton field. So I would say two to three miles is what we're finding as key sources of lagus around an individual cotton field. So it really depends on what's next to you, what you and your neighbor are working together on. Um, the twist of the whole thing has been, of course, we need to monitor these fields. I got it. We need to monitor these fields closely like you've been doing. This is a key period. We all know this is where the crop is set for both Pima and Akela, is getting that early set so we can manage the crop in a timely fashion to get it out in a timely fashion. I don't have time or actually the facts to go into detail here, but uh, one of my colleagues, for those who've ever attended a, a Cotton Incorporated research report meeting that generally occurs in March or February, April this year, uh, Jay Rosenheim at Davis has been getting some Cotton Incorporated funding over the last couple of years. And Jay is one of the most, if you don't know Jay, to me he's one of the most, um, Courageous researchers I've seen. I'll put it that way. What Jay did is he took Galen Hyatt data set along with several other PCAs in the past with yield records, to some extent square setting records, and he ran it through a number of statistical analysis to try and understand what time of the year the ligus is affecting most. Now bear in mind this wasn't an experiment. Galen Hyatt, as you know, wouldn't let that cotton field go to, let's see what happens if we get 20 lines. So it was a fairly conservative approach, but even with that, with a number of fields he had over 20 years, he had some really good numbers. And it shows two things. June is critical, July is not so critical, August isn't critical at all. In terms of one ligus can cause, you know, when you look at the, the analysis, uh, one ligus in June causes a lot more issues in yield than a July or August. And we all understand this because if we set the crop early, it's already being set, ligus isn't going to affect it, we're well on our way. This isn't to say, and the number is, is low, to say the least. And if you look at our guidelines, there's a problem, I call it the fog of the first 10 fruiting branches. Because if you use our recommendations, you're counting the top of the plant, top five squares, top five fruiting branches per square inch, and the bottom. Well, until you hit 10, they're the same. They overlap or they are the same. It's a time when it's difficult to sweep it many times until you get up to eight or nine nodes, perhaps. Depends on how fast the crop is going And so it's a little, it's always been kind of a cloudy gray area to me, is that earliest square set. Interestingly enough, that's why our recommendations and guidelines 
guidelines differ so much from Arizona. They have mid-season. There are adults and nymphs primarily are their problem. They don't really work. They don't really even start to think about it until bloom. And they say, oh, bloom must attract ligus in because that's when our problems start. Man, if you haven't done anything by ligus, if it's been a problem in your field prior to bloom, you can forget post-bloom. We all know that. So we're really early set as opposed to whatever's going on in Arizona. It's just a different system, and, and I respect that. And I really respect the data that's come out of them for the things they've developed. But what I'm just trying to say is this is the time we really need to watch it closely. We need to watch that square set closely. You now have another, you know, when, when your challenge is water, it usually isn't bugs because of the, the rainfall snowfall patterns. Well, now we've got one with some of the phenoxy stuff that may be impacting that a little bit more. Because if you look at our square retention, we don't really care if a ligus took it off or a thrips took it off or phenoxy took it off. If you're not holding what you're expected to hold, then every insect out there is going to be that much more, um, we should be that much more aware of. For those of you who are enrolled in the cotton, the sustainable cotton program, Luis is taking that data from the field, and you're going to start seeing it, I believe, if not this week, next week. This week. Yeah. As long as we get the data. Yeah, we get the data. We got it all set up now where you're going to see a shift in what your reports are getting. It's going to focus on ligus. It's going to show you your expected, expected square and your uh, your observed square. Just like you did last year, this year we're going to try and try some graphics on it to be able to just kind of Kind of watch that a little bit better. So that's really key. If you're holding what you, if you're if your square retention is better than what's expected, you're doing well. But as soon as it starts trying to drop me down, we need to take a close look at what's going on in that field. Um, so that's really the key right now. Hopefully, it's not going to be much of an issue for us. Hopefully, uh, you're not going to be located near a major source of ligus. So that brings me to the second part: is so what do we do about things that are around us? We all know the story of that. Is if, you're, if you can work with your neighbors on alfalfa. Now's the time to leave some strips of uncut alfalfa. Just hold those ligus in that, in that alfalfa field if you can, or work with your neighbor to do it. If you've got safflower near you, you know, work closely with your neighbor to get that treated. Uh, I know the Lake Bottom treated everything just before Memorial Day. They put their first application out in the safflower because that's when they felt their populations were reaching that point where they didn't want to let them go to adulthood. Not that they were going to fly out of the field at that time, but that they're going to start laying eggs and maybe that second generation is going to fly out. So they did a region-wide lake bottom treatment. Uh, all the neighbors got together and uh, they've started a, 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 they have started they started treating that safflower. If you're near a safflower, we had a field last year, we can talk about it if you're interested, right across the street from the safflower field. It was treated a couple of times. The cotton field was actually treated less than some of the other fields. We, we managed that with the PCA and the pieces data very, very well, and it got a good yield with really not an outrageous amount of, uh, of insecticide application relative to what, other, what the average was in the county. So it can be managed. It's not the end of the world, as you all know, but it really does do some good in my work with names to try and get uh, as much of that uh, light, light as control outside the field as inside. Uh, I know there's some examples I could cite in other areas where people are trying to manage uh, some of their seed alfalfa to minimize the movement over, which is far more difficult, but also a lower population than what you see coming out of hay or safflower as well. So that's the other key message I want to say is, is that there's one thing we're doing in this community that's different is we're really trying to, and I can see the difference. I can go to places and see alfalfa strips being left. I can go to places around here and see where alfalfa is being planted on what may be called weight snakerage or weight corners. That's difficult to manage anyway. So I see alfalfa going up in there to be managed really as a place where they might be able to find a home. Spray them out if you need to, whatever. So I see a lot of that community development occurring as over the years as we've been working with it. And I think we're continually working with this. Uh, this idea that uh, I think we can manage this in a way that uh, can at least avoid surprises uh, at best. So, the other thing I just want to really um, talk about is just, we mentioned, I mentioned back in you know, one of our early meetings uh, at Fireball, we talked, I talked a little bit about insecticide resistance management. This isn't an issue with us right now, particularly with lichens but it's something we always want to keep in the back of our mind. 
we've got to treat fields early for ligands, let's start with the most selective materials possible so we don't disrupt what beneficial insects. I swear sometime this year I'm going to sit down, I'm going to do a slight analysis based on what Luis comes up with. What do you find, what beneficial insects do you find in your field and approximately how many would be per acre? And what would be the cost if you had to go out and buy lace wings and my new pirate bugs to replace what was just killed? So we get an idea of just what our inventory is worth out there that occurs naturally. So it's one of these ideas I'm trying to work on just to say, you know, if you can't avoid a broad spectrum, let's try and do that. We don't want to go the same material, same material, the same material because of the resistance problems, of course. But at the same time, you've got to remember that if we're next to a safflower field and we're getting ligus coming in from the safflower field, we've already treated our cotton, you know, the good chance that what's coming out of that safflower field has been treated at least once with a pyrethrum because warrior is about the only thing people are using the safflower plus maybe an OP. If it's coming out of a seed alfalfa field, or perhaps it's coming out of an alfalfa field that's been treated for worms or something, you know, that may be less of an issue with some of the worm materials we're using. But just because we've got to treat it with a product with a certain mode of action two weeks ago and now ligus are back up, the question is, are those the same generation of ligus or are they coming from somewhere else? So it's one of the things we just got to keep in mind when we're working with insecticide resistance management. We want to make sure we don't follow too many of the same products, but at the same time, you want to think about where those bugs are coming from that may or may not, it may be a different population than what you treated two weeks ago. Probably it is. Because if you got them down near zero and they're back up to five, it means they're moving in, they're moving in from somewhere else. So you may want to try and get an estimate of what might have been used in that particular situation. But also bear in mind that maybe a back-to-back -back treatment of a particular product may not be as much of an issue where they're coming from the outside. And if I'm struck down by lightning right now, you know, it's almost a heretical heresy to say that kind of a thing. We've got to think about our ecology when we're managing these things. We can think about our ecology in a regional way. So on that note, I'm going to stop because um, the breeze can quit at any time. Of course, I can keep the breeze going. Uh, or uh, it's just going to get... But before I do, I just want to say, if you've been to the AMA, and any of you have been to the AMA meetings, and I see a lot of familiar faces here, we always have David Dahl from Merced County. And David is the AMA doc. That's his handle on, the, on his blog. I just want to say we've got the Professor Cotton over here, so we're not to be outdone. So that's your new <laughs> handle there. It's going to be Professor Cotton. Thank you very much. Any questions I can take? Be glad to. We're going to be around. We'll be around the last person. So great. That means.